Yes, is here. Good, great. Let's get started. Um, welcome everybody uh, to the Conference on World Affairs and our um, unusual panel, unusual format today um, since we're virtual. Um, those of you who know the Conference on World Affairs knows that, know that there are hundreds of panels uh, live. Um, uh, we're, we're not doing that obviously this week for obvious reasons. This is a panel on the history of pandemics, what we can learn from history. And we have three wonderful illustrious panelists um, with us today. Before I uh, introduce them, let me introduce myself. I'm Tom Zeiler, I'm a, uh, in the, a professor of history um, at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and every one of our panelists has an association with CU Boulder as well. Before we get started, let me just go over just a few of the um, ground rules and details. Um, for those of you who would like to ask a question of our panelists, um, you look at the bottom of your screen in the middle and there should be a icon that has a Q and A under it. You may um, go ahead if you're on Zoom, this won't be for the YouTube people, um, but if you're on Zoom, you can already go ahead and ask questions. I'd like you to identify yourself if you're a student um, um, or not, um, but certainly if you're a student. So go to that Q&A box, you can ask a question at any time and I'll be looking at those and try to get to as many of those as we can get to. Um, at the end of the session, um, the Conference on World Affairs is gonna be passing out a survey uh, online too. We, Greatly appreciate that if you'd um, fill that out too. So again, thank you for joining us. This panel is gonna be about an hour and a half and the format is we're going to turn to each of our panelists. I'll introduce each of them individually um, and then they will speak for seven to 10 minutes or so. Uh, and when the, our, our last panelist is done, uh, we'll go to the Q and A. So we should have plenty of time um, for your responses. Um, so let's get going here uh, too. I, I, we thought because of uh, he's, he's the farthest away, but he's uh, certainly um, uh, probably needs no introduction to, to many of you uh, that we'd start with Dan Carlin. And we'll also do this because it's somewhat chronological. Um, and as you know, Dan Carlin is a, a political commentator, a historian, a, a, a podcaster, that is truly amazing is uh, had hundreds of millions of downloads um, for his shows and really is uh, uh, one of the great storytellers of our, of our period. Um, and he weaves in information with deep questions and covers uh, history going back to the, to the very beginning. Um, Dan was a University of Colorado graduate in 1989 from the Department of History. Um, and since I'm in the history department, our other two panelists are too. Um, uh, that's very special. Um, for those of you who've been around a long time, uh, might remember some of the people he studied under, Bob Poise, Bob Holfelder, uh, William Way, and still in the department, Marjorie McIntosh, um, and others too. So um, it's great to have him back in Boulder um, uh, to talk with us too. So Dan, um, I could go on and on forever. I don't want to use your time. Um, why don't you lead us off by, by introducing us to our topic of history and pandemics? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a, it's an, you have no idea what an amazing honor it is to be with three, three CU history professors up here. I definitely feel like the odd person out. So let me do what it is I can do here. And that's sort of wonder. I'm a good wonderer. Um, we have good people to answer questions. So let me ask some questions or at least maybe set some things up. Um, how does it feel to live through a significant historical event, right? I feel like we're living in a be careful what you wish for moment here, because this is any way you want to slice it, a, a, a historical event that they will write about in the history books. And it's, it's a fascinating one because I, I, I was looking at um, a, a series, a montage of photos the other day. It was all these places that are traditionally some of the most crowded places you can ever go, right? Taj Mahal, Times Square, Trafalgar Square, all these, and they're all empty. Um, we are all experiencing the same historical moment alone together. Uh, I I'm trying to get my mind around how fascinating that is. Um, you know, one of the things, I have a chapter in, in the book that I wrote called uh, 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 Pandemic Prologue. And there've been people who've been writing me saying, wow, you must feel like Nostradamus, six months later, there's a pandemic. And I always say back to them, what 
expert hasn't been writing about this pandemic that's imminent. I've got a book here from 12 years ago and the, and the expert who's a vir virologist, I guess is the way it's, he's saying 12 years ago, we're gonna have another in influenza virus. It's gonna shut down societies. I mean, this is the worst kept secret or prediction in the world here. And, um, and I'm starting to look at bright sides. I think the natural human way we look at things like this is, oh my gosh, I can't go to my graduation or my grandmother's sick, or we have, I mean, there's a lot of downsides to look at. And I think there's, there's certain people who are devil's advocate types, and I'm one of them, where you look at good times and you find that the black cloud, but now we have black clouds and I'm finding the silver lining. And I kind of feel like maybe something like this hardens us as a society a little bit. I feel like we are, you know, how many times do you find these old codgers out there who will talk about millennials and soft kids and all these sorts of things who haven't had the depression or the second world war or all these things to teach them uh, about perspective and context and all. Well, I feel like we're getting that right now. It's a bit careful what you wish for a moment, but if we're going to go through this anyway, let's find some upsides. And I think that we're going to have in some very concrete ways, a healthcare system that comes out of this uh, less fragile and more resilient. And I think we're going to have some people who the next time the experts warn about this stuff are gonna have a very real sense of urgency as opposed to writing off. I had one person who, who wrote me a letter saying, it's ridiculous that you think that the economy would shut down if we had some sort of a modern plague. Well, here we are, okay? So question answered. Next time we talk about whether or not we should be spending money on surplus hospital capability, uh, we can talk about what the downside might be of that with real data as opposed to you know making stuff up and wondering. Um, I think we all understand that negative experiences might end up teaching us more in the long run than positive ones. The putting your hand on the hot stove is the typical example. Um, does something like this change us, right? So start with individuals. I keep wondering whether I'm different from this. And I keep thinking, yeah, I'm different. I can't tell you how I'm different, but I'm different. And I ask some other people, they say, yeah, I feel like I've been changed by this. If we are all changed by something together, um, does that become part of the collective human experience that when historians are writing down the road, they'll be able to say, oh yes, this was the generation that was hardened by the great pandemic of 2020 or something. You could always hear the way the history books talk about it like that. Um, I feel like we're living through something right now that is, um, it, it's a combination, it's a facet of the modern world because it, it puts us in touch with our ancestors more than we've been in a long time. I was reading about Edward Gibbon the other day, the guy who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He was born in 1737. He had six siblings. None of them made it out of infancy. Uh, that's probably extreme even for his era. But what does that do to a society? We haven't been there in a long time. I mean, when was the last? I think of the AIDS epidemic, and I was a theater major when I started in college. And so the AIDS epidemic was hitting. It was about 1983, and it was devastating. Well, what if all the people who had died from the 1970s to now in the AIDS epidemic had died in a year? as disruptive as that was then, imagine what that would do to us now. I feel like we are living in an era that allows us to get a preview of something that might be in our future and figure out a way to roll with those punches someday when they come. So when we try to put our lives in perspective in 20 years from now, think about what we were doing back during the great pandemic of 2020, I'd like to think that what we really gained from this was some resiliency and maybe a little bit of understanding about how we're all linked together because if you have some healthcare system in some poor country a long way away from you that's not doing very well, a lot harder to write them, them off when you realize that if they get sick over there in this world where we're jetting around with aircraft before we even know we're sick, um, we're all going to feel the pain of that one isolated region. So I feel like, you know, Francis Fukuyama had that line about the end of history when the Cold War ended. I feel like we're getting a reminder of what the patterns of human existence more normally are and maybe the last 20 or 30 years was more the anomaly. Um, so that's my uplifting rainbows and unicorns take on this, but I'd like to go to some of the experts on this panel who can maybe tell us some of the specifics before we get to the good stuff on the other side of the dark cloud. What's this dark cloud look like? Good, Dan, thank you. Um, can I just follow up with you in a general, in, in the spirit of, of uh, your comments, which were enlightening, you know, there's, I've heard a quip what, you know, what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Um, in your vast repertoire, um, wh what have we learned uh, in, this, in this pandemic, if anything, from what you've studied, maybe even beyond pandemics, crises that you've studied? I'm gonna put it in two categories. 
uh, I call it when the bodies are still warm and after the bodies have cooled category. <laughs> um, I was reading something that talked about how much better Hong Kong may have responded to this virus because they had dealt with a virus a few years ago. And that how, how to them, it wasn't a theoretical thing, right? They had real world experience from their recent memory about this. I think that's one kind of learning experience. It's the same kind of learning experience a, a globe gets after a world war, right? You get that never again period in history, right? And you get structures that are put together like leagues of nations and United Nations to see that this happened. You know? So I think we're very motivated when the, the death and the destruction is, is undeniably right around us. I think that this fades over time, and I think that's naturally. So I think that's where your your quote about what do we learn from history that we fail to learn from history. I think the generation that experiences the hot stove remembers how it feels. I think their children who might have heard stories about how the hot stove burned my hand remember how it feels. I think a couple generations after that, I think it's maybe almost a human defense mechanism that we can forget trauma, that we don't have to still live with the trauma of the Punic Wars, feeling the way it did the day after they ended. At the same time, the, the converse uh, element of that is that when the bodies don't smell anymore, you forget how nasty a world war or a holocaust or a genocide or a pandemic can be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. I'm sure we're going to come back to a lot of this. And you've set a, a great framework um, for our, our panel, too. Um, so let's let's move on to our next panelist. And I'm sure there's going to be questioners, too. Uh, by the way, I'm aware that the Q&A function uh, for some of you is not working or uh, we're on mute or you want all four of us um, uh, pictured at the same time. That's up to the Conference on World of Staff P uh, Affairs staff. So um, I've alerted them to this, too. So uh, please be patient on this and we'll get everything working. Um, it's our first time through. Let us move to our second panelist, is my colleague in the Department of History, Elizabeth or Lil Fenn who is the Walter and Lucy and Driscoll Professor of Western American History and also a distinguished professor um, at CU Boulder. Um, her field of study is early American West uh, and focuses uh, very timely for us on epidemic disease, Native Americans and environmental history. Um, in her first book on, uh, called Pax Americana, uh, the great smallpox, smallpox epidemic of 1775 uh, to 82. And uh, you probably know that one, or certainly her Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book, Encounters at the Heart of the World, A History of the Men and People. She won the Pulitzer Prize for that in 2012, uh, History of the Men and People, and uh, covers that from 1100 to 1845. I always um, laugh about that as a, as a US historian. You know, I think my field is huge if I have to cover 25 years. So Lil, um, uh, like Dan covers uh, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, so Lil will talk to us uh, about, um, uh, I imagine, environmental history and going back, going way back into um, uh, history of the world too. So Lil, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, although under these unfortunate circumstances. It is truly a, a, a remarkable time to be a historian of uh, infectious disease. What I'd like to do to start is to ask you to keep some basic epidemiologic principles in mind as you try to think about all of this. So let me just lay out three principles with a nod to a, an Australian virologist named Frank Fenner, uh, no relation to me. Um, so for an ep epidemic to occur, you really need three things. First, you need the presence of a pathogen. Second, you need the presence of vulnerable individuals. And third, you need connections between them. You need something that brings pathogens and vulnerable human animals together. Uh, and in this respect, historical developments in transportation, globalization, environment, uh, things that might cause crowding or enhance prospects for mosquitoes or rats or lice or fleas, um, these different things all come into play, um, all these different developments over, over history. So humans and infectious disease have influenced each other for millennia but they have especially done so since the dawn of agriculture roughly 10,000 years ago. Um, the dawn of agriculture did two things. 
first it put human and non-human domesticated animals in close long-term proximity so that microbes could readily cross the so-called species barrier. Um, second, it allowed for the accumulation and storage of grain so that cities with dense pop human populations could develop. And this, of course, allowed infections to, to evolve and to circulate more effectively. Uh, some of the oldest identified human infections include tuberculosis, Hansen's disease, which we used to call leprosy, and perhaps most infamously, plague. And uh, we've had a lot of really interesting recent work on, on plague that involves the analysis of ancient DNA. Uh, and it has enabled historians and scientists collaborating to confirm plague pandemics that we had really had only speculated about, dating back to about the year 250 in Ethiopia, Rome, Greece, and Syria. Uh, and honestly, plague makes uh, COVID-19 look like child's play. Um, I, I suspect that everybody in, in the audience has heard of the Black Death, the plague pandemic that killed, killed 25 million people in Asia before it reached Europe around 1347, and there killed another 100 million or so. Um, you know, we're fretting about a case fatality rate of one, one and a half percent today. Well, plague had a case fatality rate of 40 to 60 percent. And it appears that almost everyone in Europe was affected. Um, and as much as half of the population died. Historians have credited the Black Death with uh, bringing down feudalism, bringing on the Renaissance. And that gives you a sense of the kind of impact that pandemics could have. Now, from the American perspective, the only human disease we've ever eradicated, smallpox, may well have been the most consequential. Um, with case fatality rates of like of, of 38% or even higher, smallpox was among the most deadly infect of the infections transported across the Atlantic Ocean in the so-called Columbian exchange. This was the trans-oceanic transfer of species that came in the aftermath of Christopher Columbus's voyages to the Americas. And basically one epidemic after another swept the Western hemisphere in the centuries that followed Columbus's voyage. Um, Scholars have yet to reach any kind of consensus on the size of indigenous populations in the Americas at the time of European and African contact, but it's clear that smallpox and other imported infections really did the dirty work of colonization, undercutting native populations. Uh, and I really, the, the extent of those losses makes native resistance all the more remarkable in my view. It's also worth adding that smallpox was de deployed deliberately as a weapon of war against America's native peoples. Now, some other pandemics in the North American context that had great consequence for our history uh, include an outbreak of mosquito-borne yellow fever in 1793 that uh, devastated the national capital of Philadelphia. Um, this yellow fever outbreak sent the well-to-do and sent Congress fleeing Philadelphia for safer climates and locations in outlying communities. Um, ongoing yellow fever during the Haitian Revolution uh, actually led Napoleon to turn over Louisiana to the United States in 1803. And then outbreaks of cholera in 1832, uh, let me remember the dates, 49, and then I guess in the 1860s, um, came hand in hand with fear of immigrants and sent wealthy New Yorkers scurrying for safety from the city to their summer homes. Um, I think it, those epidemics may in some ways be most comparable to what we are witnessing today. Um, there were Those same cholera epidemics collaborated with 
nationwide uh, yellow fever in 1878 to compel city, state, and national governments to establish public health infrastructures in the interests of disease mitigation. Um, influenza in, in 1918, which Susan is going to talk about, likewise induced the federal government to implement uh, an influenza-like illness surveillance program that persists to the present day and actually tagged this coronavirus epidemic very um, early in the game. Um, so all of these epidemics and more recent ones in the 20th and 21st centuries that I haven't really mentioned, including HIV and AIDS, are compelling, I think, for the ways in which they re reveal the fault lines in the societies in which they unfolded. And my impression is that COVID-19 is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, the question, which I think relates to what Dan raised, is whether in revealing the fault lines, it can also generate healing. And that, I think, remains to be seen. Thank you, Lil. Um, thank you. Uh, just uh, a, qu uh, a, qu a quick follow-up of something that um, you raised about um, pre-Columbian expansion or, or, or post-Columbian expansion or the age of exploration, um, which, um, you know, also has, uh, is, is looked on uh, positively uh, uh, through history. Um, obviously, there was tragedy, um, and as you mentioned, intentional killing in that. Um, it, it kind of makes me think of, uh, you know, calling this virus the China virus, um, since most of those were the European viruses. Um, what were, was this spread of disease uh, from Europe here, was it inevitable as much as it spread today through globalization? Was that an early form of this kind of contact of civilizations? Yeah, I, I, I do think it was an inevitable spread of disease. Um, whether it could have been controlled is another matter. It's a hypothetical, which is really almost impossible to address aside from the times in which it was uh, deployed deliberately. Um, and, and what we see with the Colombian exchange is perhaps not the first globalization. You could also attribute the Black Death to globalization as well, because it was carried there by, by Mongol, carried to Europe by Mongol expansion. But this is certainly a second globalization in the Colombian exchange with consequences that are clearly akin to what we've seen with the influenza in 1918, what we see saw with the HIV and AIDS, and what we're seeing today with uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, and we'll come back, I'm sure, to a lot of that. Um, we have lost Susan Kent, or she's lost her connection right now. So while she's fighting to get it back, um, um, we talk about globalization and, uh, and innovative technology. Um, hopefully she'll be innovative and we'll get her back. But let me, why don't I just go to some of the uh, Q&A here too. Um, we've got one questioner, Jim Boyd, who asked this related to what we were just talking about. And this could be for both um, Lil and Dan. Uh, how does communication technology change or shape a societal response to quarantine? Or how does access to this technology exacerbate the rich and poor divide as well? So how does access to this technology uh, lead societies to respond in certain ways in, in, in history and, and today? Dan, you want to take that? Well, I just all I would say is I think what we're doing here is a perfect example of trying to roll with the punches, right? I mean, this is uh, these were things that were planned as brick and mortar events, and uh, and people are trying to figure out how do we best do those same events under the under the limitations that we're dealing with right now. Um, I I don't know how it affected things in the past because I feel like from a technological standpoint we're in such uncharted territory that any comparison with the past, you know, if you're to compare say print or letter writing or any, it almost seems so apples and oranges by comparison. Um, I do think though the phones and the ability to involve sick people in the healthy world is an interesting thing. So the way some kids have been. 
um, seeing their grandparents, say, through the glass at some hospital or at some facility where they're still communicating with them or whatnot. I do feel like when I read about the, the Black Plague and they'd said that one of the worst parts about it was these are people who lived in a society where close personal contact was so important to their well-being and the plague disrupted that, I feel like technology, if anything else, means we don't have to be as isolated as we used to. Uh, but I'm sure Lil has some, some uh, interesting points on that as well. Thanks, Dan. Lil, you want to? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think Dan's right. The, the technology means we don't need to be as isolated as we once would have been in a similar situation. Uh, I also think that there is some resonance uh, with a, a deeper past. Um, you know, I've become acutely aware that not everybody has the luxury of staying at home. Um, some people need to get out there and work. They're performing essential tasks. Um, their landlord hasn't given them a break on the rent or whatever. So um, most of us in this, on this panel, at least, I think do have the luxury of working at home and, at home and, and still collecting a paycheck. The, the analogy that comes to, hand, to mind for me goes back to the 18th century uh, when a, an immunization technique that was called variolation was developed in which uh, you would pay a smallpox doctor, they called it inoculation back then, um, but you would, you would pay a, a, a doctor to deliberately infect you with smallpox, mm. usually through a cut or an, you know, an abrasion or an incision on your hand or your arm. Uh, the live pustular matter would be taken from a sick person and implanted in, into your flesh and you would develop a mild case of the the disease. And to be clear, even variolation had about a 5% case fatality rate. But you would acquire, a, you develop a, a mild case of smallpox, um, hopefully you'd live, and then you would have immunity for the rest of your life. The point wow. I want to make is that hmm. it took a month to go through this procedure. And not everybody could afford it to stop plowing the fields, working in the, the cobbler shop for a month. Um, and so this really became the prerogative of the well-to-do. Moreover, well-to-do inoculees, because they came down with smallpox, were at risk of infecting others if they didn't quarantine themselves. So there was a, a similar divide, not necessarily uh, related to communication, at least in the 18th century. Um, but I do think it's a similar mm -hmm. divide. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, let me ask a few questions that are somewhat related to this. But what you're both saying is obviously society matters, uh, class matters, you know, a lot of these things matter. What about, though, um, the settlers? Somebody's asked a question, Janet Lieber has asked a question, was how was smallpox introduced deliberately without infecting settlers? Uh, and relatedly, somewhat relatedly, perhaps, as Stephanie Helsel asks also, um, can mosquitoes be carriers of COVID-19? So an intentional in, um, uh, infection, but also um, um, now one from mosquitoes or, you know, out in the wild in nature. Well, I, 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 can, I can tackle at least the, the smallpox dimensions of, of that. Um, and I, I can't address whether mosquitoes could carry uh, the coronavirus, this coronavirus. Um, but uh, it, it's a really great question because it, it gets down to some important epidemiological distinctions between epidemics and endemicity. Uh, if, uh, if you are of a certain age, in the audience, uh, you may well have had chicken pox as a child, or you might have had measles or mumps as a child before vaccinations were developed. And the reason you contracted chicken pox or mumps or something is because these diseases were endemic, which means they're constantly present in the background. You encountered it as a child, you either lived or, or, or died, uh, and you garnered immunity in that fa fashion. So smallpox, it turns out, by the 18th century was endemic in Europe. Uh, this meant that most Europeans encountered it 
as children and then by the time they reached adulthood had lived through the disease and were immune. Smallpox was not endemic in the Americas. So if, uh, if colonists arrived from Europe, they were likely to be immune. But anyone born and raised in the Americas, whether you were European American, African American, Native American, doesn't matter. If you were born and raised here, you probably didn't encounter smallpox as a child and you were probably vulnerable to it as an adult. Mm. So those distinctions um, could play into the decision to, uh, to use smallpox as a weapon of war, certainly. And when the one time we had the best evidence for it was in 1763, and the, the, one of the officers involved expressed real concern that he might contract smallpox. Yeah, a little very interesting. And Danny, you're gonna sign off, but we've also got a, a comment that's somewhat related in what we are talking about about class too. Um, who's writing the histories of these pandemics when they're written? Uh, centuries ago? Is it a wealthy class? I mean, are, are the poor really writing these histories um, um, of past pandemics? Um, or do they have the death sentence? And, and they can, you know, they're the victims that, or masses of them. Is that, is that generally true? I guess it's who, whoever writes history. I think it's still true today. I mean, I, I think if you go to a lot of the countries where the health systems are are not up to, to the standards that we're accustomed to that have to deal with disease on, on a level that, that, that we haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, I think it's, uh, you, could, you could see right there that it's a question of, you know, do you have access to clean drinking water, sanitation facilities, mm -hmm. hospitals when you need them, vaccinations? I mean, uh, and I do think that this is one of the things that the current situation we're going through reminds us of. If the health system in Wuhan, China is lacking something, we have a reason to be concerned potentially about that in a way we didn't really consider before. I mean, how long did it take to get from there to here? That shows us how really interconnected we all are in a way that you weren't. I mean, in medieval Europe, talking about the Mongol conquest, making it possible for uh, a, an early version of some kind of first contact to happen with disease. Well, I mean, we're all in now, you know? I mean, uh, if there's an Ebola hemorrhagic fever outbreak in the Congo, um, it might not come here, but you sure as heck better be concerned if only because, forget the reality of it, the fear alone can shut your economy down. Yeah. I mean, there was, a, and Lil, Lil, you'll know about this, but I, one of the things I included in my book was the, the, um, the uh, accidental smallpox. I think it was the last person who contracted smallpox in the 1970s. And yeah. she was a woman working in, in, a, uh, in a room below like a lab that we're, was yeah. working with one of the few samples left. And she got it. And I guess smallpox would not be a very good weaponized thing today if you were trying to make a biological weapon. But if you just wanted to make something that scared the bejesus out of everybody, uh, everybody freaked out when this happened. So I do think that half the problem here is the actual illness and what that can do to you. The other half of the problem is what we might do in response to the illness. Yeah, very good. And we're going to come back to this. Um, too, I'm sure, and we have questions related to all of this. Before, <laughs> before we lose her, uh, here's Susan Kent, um, who has uh, obviously not worn a mask, but has mastered her technology and is back, um, I hope, with us. Susan, are you okay? She's frozen again. All right, well, let's go back to questions then. I see her, I see her here, but let's go back, um, let's go back to our questions and hopefully we'll be able to um, um, get her in here. Uh, can I, can I just uh, add on to what sure. Dan just said? You know, the, sure. um, part of the question at least was about who ends up writing these histories. And I think what Dan was suggesting is it's the survivors. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that wealth and class and geographies, you know, ma many different contingencies feed into being a survivor. Um, and I, and I do think it's the well-to-do who end up writing history, you know, Thucydides' account of the plague of Athens, or Daniel Defoe's journal of the plague year, Samuel Pepys' journal. These are all literate elites who end up leaving us the historical accounts. Um, and, and I think it behooves us to uh, gather up as many um, accounts from people who are out there on the front lines whether as essential workers or as medical 
workers, healthcare workers right now as we possibly can so that um, we have really good grist for the mill when it comes to writing the history of this epidemic. Yeah, that's a good que good uh, point by both of you. And um, we had a question that's sort of related to that. So are there groups in society who are more vulnerable to getting the, these diseases, um, the poor, um, the Lil, you just mentioned healthcare workers. I mean, so how do you, how do you protect everybody? What was done in the past? What did people do in the past to protect themselves? Yeah. Um, you know, often not much was done. This was a really devastating phenomenon for Native American peoples because uh, the, the doctors, the shamans, medicine women, medicine men were the ones who became sick first. And, you know, it, and they contracted these diseases in the course of treating others and then died. And they died carrying knowledge with them, carrying cultural information with them, healing methods with them. Um, you know, as some people saw entire clans wiped out in the course of a single epidemic. Uh, and, and I think this happens again and again. You, you see health care workers succumbing early on. Before, before germ theory, in the, in the late 19th century, not a lot was done to protect health care workers. I think one of the fun experiments, to be honest, at this time period is how much human collective behavior will change or not change yeah. based on the fact that we have a better understanding of what causes this disease is the is the collective fear or or overreaction any better or any worse because we know what causes it i feel like that's one of the guinea pig you know sample things we're going yeah. through right now to see and it's been fascinating and again if you didn't have any skin in the game you'd want to just take notes i mean it is a fascinating human experience and that's why i think i i miss um I miss uh, uh, Susan's comments here because I feel like she can tell us a lot about in a modern society, because you know the early 19th, the early 20th century is a modern society that understands germs and all that, how, how they did or did not react a whole lot differently than say people from the middle ages who had a combination of magic and traditional folklore to work with. Um, it would be interesting if we didn't react any differently, if the knowledge didn't insulate us from panic at all, uh, I'd be fascinated and I'd be just as fascinated if it did. Mm -hmm. Maybe it just insulates some of us. <laughs> yeah, good point. And we'll try to get Susan back here. Um, relatedly, though, do we, we know how this one started, COVID-19? Do we know how the Black Plague, do we know how some of these other ones started? And how does that compare to this pandemic of 2020? Well, this is a little question for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Thanks, go to the man. experts on this, shall we? <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately, my, my knowledge of the Black Death at, at this moment in time is, is pretty Eurocentric. It started in Asia uh, and was carried uh, westward by Mongols expanding across Asia um, it, it, and killed millions of people in Asia before it reached Europe. And then it bounced around Europe for, for years thereafter. Um, I mean, the real origin is again, this kind of cross species uh, contamination or you know, jump between, you know, from, from rats to fleas. So you'd have a plague infected rat, a flea on, on the rat would bite the rat, be infected with plague and then convey that plague to a human being um, that it bit. And that process happened again and again um, across Asia and into Europe. There is a form of plague that's called pneumonic plague, um, but this is the classic bubonic plague that we're, we're talking mm -hmm. about here. Yeah. And we should point out that they had the, they had the bubonic plague several hundred years before with the plague of Justinian, yes. which is, you know, from, from a localized standpoint, probably just as bad for the people in Byzantium as it was for the people in Western Europe a couple hundred, several hundred years later. 
Um, same sort of thing, though. Maybe they, they you know, I, and I don't know about this. I'm, I'm sure that they're going back and doing DNA sequencing of all this stuff. It'd be fascinating to see, like they sometimes find, uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, Lou, but they sometimes find people buried uh, from a long time ago and, and, and much longer ago than they thought they would find things like bubonic plague and they'll test positive for the virus. For, it's a bacteria, right? It's a, um, it's, yeah. Yeah, so so we, so so already the knowledge that we that many of us grew up with back in the old days is being changed daily by people out on the front lines on this. It is. They they've been using um, ancient DNA, basically DNA extracted from human tooth enamel, and to identify changes in the plague bacillus over time using you know molecular clock dating and many things that I have be really challenged to understand and comprehend. Uh, and they've, they've been able to really parse out the phylogenetics of, of plague, going back to the Justinian plague, um, to the Cyprian plague that preceded that. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating collaboration of plague historians and, and other and, and, uh, geneticists. And that's how they found out that the plague, the famous plague of Athens from the Peloponnesian War was probably typhoid fever, right? Same sort of thing. Yeah, um, I don't know the answer to that. And I, I think I, it's I thought, burials, I though. I think it was still out, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's Susan, so let's get her on. <laughs> let's get Hi, Susan. Susan on. We missed you. Uh, okay. Susan, you, you there? Okay. Yes, I am, and I apologize. No problem. Let me introduce you quickly, and we'll get, get you bef and, and get you talking here. So Susan Ken is another colleague of mine. Uh, um, an arts and science professor of distinction who specializes in modern British history. Um, um, uh, lots of publications on gender and culture and imperialism for our panel. Um, uh, probably most relevant is an e-text, The History of Western Civilization, an Ecological Approach since 1500. She's also written on the global influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 in a book that came out uh, about eight years ago. Uh, Susan, take it away. Yes, and I apologize if I lose you or you lose me. Um, somehow my internet connection here is very bad. Um, the flu pandemic of 1918-19 killed at least 50 and perhaps as many as 100 million people across the globe uh, in the space of six months, which is an extraordinary event. It appeared in the middle of the Great War and uh, turned out to be, in fact, more lethal than any other disease since the visitations of the Black Death in the 14th century. It killed more than any other single event of the 20th century, with the exception of the Second World War. And as one uh, medical official in Britain put it, it appeared with explosive suddenness and simply had its way. It came like a thief in the night and stole treasure. Uh, of any thousand people who uh, came down with the flu, 800 of them had a, a mild disease, which looks like the uh, numbers for today as well. But of that 20% of those 200 people who actually got a uh, heavy case of the virus, about 80% of them died. Hmm. Now the flu uh, wreaked havoc on the military and civilian populations across the globe in three separate waves. It appeared first in the American Midwest in late winter and early spring of 1918 and spread from a military camp, Camp Funston, outside of Fort Riley, Kansas, to another military camp, Camp Oglethorpe in Georgia. And from there uh, up the East Coast and across the Atlantic Ocean with troop ships taking soldiers to the Western Front. Contemporaries referred to it as the Spanish flu, uh, mistakenly believing that it uh, had originated there in Spain. It had not, as we think we now know, but Spain was one of the few countries during this uh, four-year Great War period that had not imposed a news embargo anywhere and so that it was the one place from which news about the flu was actually being reported. And so it looked to many other uh, countries, those especially th that did have a news blackout during the war, that in fact the disease was coming from there. Um, 
1918, what we're dealing with is an emotionally and physically exhausted European population, which would prove absolutely no match even for this first wave of the flu, which was relatively mild. Um, from Europe, it moved across the continent into Asia, um, south into Africa, and arrived in Australasia, in New Zealand and Australia, uh, in July of 1918. And again, as this first, in, this first wave of the flu was relatively mild, it didn't cause very much alarm, but it was followed by an onslaught of unprecedented lethality, unprecedented force. Because in mid-August of 1918, the virus mutated and what is called the second wave of the influenza pandemic began to make itself felt. It moved along commercial and military transportation lines across routes, uh, along routes that um, spread out across the globe, and it left virtually no population of the world untouched. Now the soldiers fighting on the Western Front in Europe suffered especially harsh attacks. They were laid low by fever and then by opportunistic pneumonia that took advantage of the weakened conditions of the soldiers in the trenches. And thousands and thousands of soldiers who weren't uh, necessarily in the trenches having already been invalided to the rear areas to convalesce. The US forces suffered more deaths from the flu in October of 1918 at the height of the offensive against the Germans than they did from battle. And after the armistice of November 1918, the incidence of cases declined, but they sprang back again. The flu came back again in January and February of 1919, at which time the disease had, had weakened um, to a, certainly a lesser extent than it had enjoyed in the second wave, but it nevertheless caused a great many deaths because the populations of Europe in particular had been um, exhausted and were uh, significantly weakened both by the flu itself and by the deprivations caused by the Great War. Um, it ended or seemed to end certainly as an epidemic and pandemic in the spring of 1919, though there were individual cases that continued to break out, not on pandemic or epidemic scale, but individual cases right into 1920. Now, uh, the particular configurations of this influenza virus were in fact a product of the Great War. The conditions of the war enabled a common and usually mild disease to mutate into a deadly strain that then spread like wildfire across the globe, killing not only the weakest in the population, but the very strongest as well. It took advantage of thousands of people congregating together in army camps and in hospitals. It um, had the benefit of a, a population of robust young men, healthy young men, moving in and out of uh, the theater of war. And um, once, once that robust, healthy population contracted the flu, they became quite weakened by it and therefore became vulnerable as well. Now, the reason I say that the war was so great a factor in this is that flu viruses often mutate, but usually they don't have the opportunity to last long enough to let those mutations be passed down and to take effect. Um, in ordinary conditions, as I say, um, a virus that mutates into a, especially a, a deadly strain will not have sufficient hosts to sustain itself. It, it would kill off its hosts too quickly to be able to reproduce and then pass on its characteristics. But as I say, though, the conditions of war in 1918 ensured that sufficient hosts, healthy, robust young men were continuously made available so that the virus was able to survive in, and reproduce. As soldiers fell ill, they were brought to the rear areas and replaced by others who rotated into the camps and into the trenches. The camps and trenches were thus filled with 
men who were infected with the virus but not yet sick and could pass it along to men who were not yet infected with the virus, enabling this virus to be suckered and, and sustained uh, and ultimately lead to a terrible virulence and mortality rate. Without the particular circumstances thrown up by the Great War, this virulent strain of influenza would not have been able to maintain its presence and take down so many victims. Now, as is the case today, governments and public health officials responded to the epidemic haphazardly. At one extreme, uh, the Germans put a complete embargo on any kind of information coming out of its um, uh, official headquarters or news, news venues, anything about a disease that threatened the public health would not be allowed to be mentioned. Um, some of those accounts started to come into Germany from some foreign areas in May of 1918, and again, attributing the flu to Spain, hence calling it the Spanish flu. But even when the most virulent strain appeared in September of 1918, uh, the German um, uh, wartime authority, which were now under martial law for all intents and purposes in Germany, refused to allow any kind of dissemination of information. And so um, there's no attempt on the part of German authorities to restrict movement, to close down uh, areas of congregation or uh, to treat the flu in any way. Not that the, tree, not that the flu could be treated. In fact, um, uh, in a number of belligerent countries, uh, authorities closed the schools, they closed theaters, libraries, and other places where large populations might congregate. They did not close bars or churches. Um, and this is where a great many civilians would have been exposed to the virus and uh, contracted it. Uh, the public and their servants, the police, nurses, bus drivers, soldiers, and the like, were urged to wear masks. Um, the uh, authorities in virtually every country um, allowed for advertisements that were quite bogus. This will sound somewhat familiar to us today, I'm afraid, so that they would tout the benefits of alcohol, of tobacco, of patent medicines, of home remedies that involved things like garlic or camphor or cinnamon, quinine, uh, arsenic sometimes. And here's another good one, sugar cubes soaked in kerosene. Mm. Nothing worked. So what I'd like to do is leave it here for now and talk maybe with the rest of you and, and with the audience about the kinds of consequences that this massive fatality event had on subsequent world events, economically, politically, militarily, whatever it might be. Because um, as we'll see when we get further into this, the flu had an outsized impact on the course of events that followed 1918 and 1919, even though it was an event that we seem to have forgotten for about 60 or 70 years, having um, entered into a kind of collective amnesia about the flu, um, it nevertheless had a profound impact on world events. Thank you, Susan. Quick question, did, did President Woodrow Wilson Indeed, that's one of those. That's one of those events I'm speaking of. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and and another question, and then let's open it up. And um, thank you for this. Um, we use the term social distancing uh, today and flattening the to flatten the curve. From your experience looking at this pandemic today, um, comparing it to social distancing back then, a hundred years ago, how do we stack up, or how do they stack up to us? Well, there were a great many communities that did not um, undertake social distancing. So one of, the, one of the prime examples is the city of Philadelphia, which refused to shut down and took on um, uh, death rates that were astronomical. And at the very opposite end of that spectrum is Gunnison, Colorado, where in fact the town's town fathers and mothers 
shut the town down, didn't let people in, didn't let people out. And that community was spared uh, extensive morbidity and mortality rates while the surrounding areas were hit quite hard. So um, it's again, one of those moments where paying attention to, to um, directives to keep far away which you cannot do in wartime, obviously. I mean, it's just not something that's possible in so many parts of the world. Um, nevertheless, where, where staying away from one another was implemented, the effects were quite dramatically reduced. And did, and, and we can open this up to Lil and Dan too, um, um, media or communications. Uh, what were the effects? Did, did, did word get out? Obviously, people knew about these flus and pandemics. Mm -hmm. um, was that an effective way to control them or was it not? Well, um, again, we're in wartime, so there's going to be some degree of censorship taking place. Um, um, the United States, for instance, did not shut down reporting on the influenza epidemic, but it it wouldn't have the same kind of reach as we might see even 10 years later when we have radios, which we don't have in the same numbers in 1918. I mean, that's a function of the 1920s and 30s. So what people would have had to rely on would be newspapers, um, would be public health posters that might be uh, posted at the post office or the local grocery store. Communication would have been um, quite a bit more difficult and notifications of things uh, would have been harder to get across than certainly we would see even 10 or 20 years later. People panic or buy a lot of toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> and, that, and that goes, and, and, but seriously, that goes back to some of these other pandemics too that uh, Dan and Lil have talked about too. Uh, how did people respond, the, the average but, person? Well, yeah. There was a great deal of panic, and it d would depend on what part of the world we're talking about. Um, um, part of the panic had to do with observing people dropping dead in the streets, quite literally. When one of those um, 200 that I spoke of who contracted a virulent uh, strain of the flu, when they did, very often um, they were hit by an immune response, a cytokine storm as, as they're talking about it these days, that would overwhelm um, a number of their organs, not least their lungs. And it would they would produce a um, cyanosis, a blue color to the face and hands and extremities of patients. And, and those who watched a friend or a loved one literally turn bright blue and fall down on the floor. You can imagine the kind of response that would evoke, the kind of um, not just fear, but panic to see this sort of thing happen. Doctors actually were panicking as well because they had no idea how to treat this. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't treat it. They couldn't prevent it from um, striking down so many people. So yes, there was worldwide panic. Uh, again, without the kind of communication systems that we obviously have in place now, but even 50 years ago, um, the, the communication of the panic itself over media would have been lessened, it seems to me. And very quickly then, um, how quick was a vaccine created? Well, we don't have a flu vac. We don't know what viruses are until 1933. They believed they were treating bacteria. So they tried to create um, uh, a vaccine, but obviously because it was a virus and they're building antibacterial things, it had no impact. They could not treat this disease. So we've come a long way, at least in that regard, when we talk yeah. about medicine. Let, let me ask, uh, um, and one of our questioners, Chris, um, asks a broader question to bring in all three of you too. Um, in past pandemics, uh, was it human intervention that was played the biggest role in ending the pandemic or did the disease just simply run its course? Perhaps why it, some of these diseases lasted years, right? Somebody want to take it, well? It depends. Mm. <laughs> it depends is the, is the best answer I can give. Uh, and it depends on the, the epidemic that you're talking about. Um, one of the things we haven't 
mentioned yet, but I know you, it, it's been circulating in the media, is that that phrase herd immunity. Uh, and for mm -hmm. pathogens that convey or confer immunity upon those who survive them, herd immunity can be a powerful force in suppressing an epidemic. Um, vaccination, if it's available, can also be a powerful force in suppressing an epidemic because if you remember those three epidemiological principles I started out with, you no longer have sufficient vulnerable people in your population for the pathogen to move about effectively. Um, so sometimes epidemics like smallpox, measles, influenza could subside because of the level of herd immunity in a population. Um, the other thing that could inflect this is seasonality. Cholera, for example, and influenza um, has a and New Yorkers would, uh, they'd hear about a cholera outbreak in, in Europe or on, on the Russian pale, and they'd, you know, the, the newspapers would kind of spread this, this anticipate, this dread and anticipation, and it would arrive in the, in the spring or the summer, and people would flee, and it would you know, last through the summer, and then the frost would come. Um, frost was key to controlling mosquito-borne diseases. So epidemics would flare up in the summer, uh, and then they'd subside when the frost killed the mosquitoes uh, in the fall. Wow. Wow. Dan, you want to? Well, I mean, I was just, I was thinking, you know, my brain goes into different directions sometimes because I was thinking about Susan's talking about a pandemic in what is, if we're looking at the vast, you know, array of history, relatively modern times. And I remember a CU professor explaining to us long time ago how taboos got started amongst ancient people. So I think he was talking about Southwestern Native American tribes that wouldn't eat fish or something from, from that was just taboo. And, I, and, and he says, how do these things get started? They get started for, for good reasons amongst people that don't necessarily have an idea what cause and effect is going on, but they can surmise. And if you don't have written materials to, to transmit, I mean, Lil was talking about the equivalent of the death of Native American, American medicinal institutional memory, as we might call it, um, when, when, the, um, when the shaman and whatnot were killed by these diseases. But if you have things like longstanding taboos amongst ancient people, that's a way to keep maybe what was once a common sense um, traditional method like don't eat this kind of food because once upon a time we ate this kind of food and a lot of people got sick. So now that's a taboo. How to keep those sorts of things alive past the current generation or the current um, uh, people that carry the institutional knowledge with them. I mean, I took a whole course once where they talked about how people before modern medicine created some sort of system that had any effect at all. And they were talking about the Babylonian record keeping. And they said, if you just keep good records for centuries, that's really helpful. Um, and so wondering the difference, uh, when, I, when I had read about the 1918 flu pandemic, the part that knocks you out is how modern we are and, yes. and yet how vulnerable we still were. And I think we're seeing a replay of that again today. I mean, here we are, we can create test tube children, we can do all these, we can go to the moon, but we don't seem a whole lot safer from this than the 1918 population seen from their pandemic, even if I realize that's an illusion. I wonder though, if the pluses and minuses don't balance out. I mean, we understand and have better medicine, but they weren't flying around on airplanes, right? So, so at some point, is there an equilibrium that, that modern technology helps us, but modern transportation systems and globalization hurts us? I don't know. Starting to wonder if we don't, shouldn't all have a bunch of taboos about social distancing maybe for a while. Which gets back to our earlier discussion about poverty and the poor being affected, but maybe it's the wealthy who are also affected in this era of globalization. After all, they're the ones that fly. I had uh, a person who yeah. said that that's the only time anything gets done. So maybe we should, I mean, poor people can die all over the world and it's just some tragedy you don't think of. But when the leader of a community or the wealthy people, I mean, Bill Gates has been the one warning everybody about this for years and years and years. Um, maybe it's when either the wealthy pay attention or care 
that the real panic starts because I feel like poor people all over the world with poor sanitation and poor hospital systems have been dying all, all the time. This mm -hmm. is when the rest of us kind of jump on board the bandwagon and go, somebody has to do something quickly. Yeah. My sure. grandmother could I, get I completely sick. agree with that that assessment, Dan. I mean that, you know, that's really spot on. Um when cholera was finally addressed in New York City, it was and, and other cities too, it was because the wealthy put the heat on city governments and state governments to address it. Uh, so that that I think the pattern you've identified is is spot on. You can make the case for progressive era reform in the era that Susan's talking about, too. Um, and Dan, Dan, I was uh, interested, I guess, kosher, uh, kosher laws. Uh, perhaps. Really? We're part, we're part of that, I would imagine. Uh, sure, halal, all that stuff. Sure, it makes sense. Yeah. Let, let me ask all of you then a, a question. Somebody can take this one, too. Um, the Black Death is the Black Death. That seems like the, the Black Plague seems like the, uh, the mother of all. The gold and, and, standard? Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, compared, from what we know about the, uh, the this disease now and the effects of it, how does this one compare to the other pandemics? Um, or, and and, and are, do you have fears that this could get even bigger and really compare, um, I, I, for lack of a better word, favorably um, to what's happened in the last four, five, six, eight hundred years? We'll, we'll talk the, about smallpox. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the speed of transmission is stunning by comparison to earlier epidemics, possibly with the exception of 1918, uh, where the speed of transmission was, was really pretty extraordinary. But uh, we need to remember case fatality rates and morbidity rates, which is sort of the rate of infection. You know, the Black Death basically Everybody in Europe contracted this disease at some point. And ballpark half the population died. You know, so that's let's say roughly a 50% a case fatality rate. Um, and today we're talking about what, one, 2% case fatality rate. And that makes this in some respects pale by comparison. Of course, our population, our global population is enormous by comparison. So in sheer numbers, we may see you know, something equivalent. And I think that, you know, the, the political consequences of the Black Death, the end of, of, of serfdom, I mean, and it's, it's an extraordinary event that follows this, what, 25 year impact on Europe in that, that uh, the, you lose a quarter of the population who's doing your labor and you have to come up with an entirely new social, socioeconomic system. Yeah. You know, I've wondered if we're going to see an an, uh, an upsurge in labor activism um, as workers assert their rights to work in a safe workplace and to earn a living wage while they're doing hazardous duty. Yeah. You know, and we certainly saw peasants enabled um, in the aftermath of the, the Black Death. Mm -hmm. Lil had talked about death rates. And the one thing I keep trying to remember, so we can talk about smallpox, which was eradicated two thirds of the way through the 20th century and still may have killed half a billion people, right? But that's just one of the things people had going on. So here we are worried about this COVID virus right now. And if you say, well, smallpox was bad too, but smallpox wasn't all they had to deal with. The people that were going through Susan's 1918 flu epidemic were going through smallpox too and had all those other things too. And so yeah. when, that's what I said when Edward Gibbons' six siblings die, they don't all die from one epidemic. They die from the extreme lethality of the age and the lack of things to do about it. So we're talking about how we respond to one pandemic here. The people who lived in eras before now, even when they weren't in an active pandemic, would have absolutely lethal levels of disease by today's standards. Sure, and as all of you have said, I mean, it it brings it can bring down a whole society or or organizations like feudalism. So let let's talk a little bit about economics. Um, we're seeing the effect today, obviously. Um, Susan, I don't know if the recession after World War One is directly linked to um, you know the 1918 flu, but I don't know. I don't know. The Great Depression obviously is something else uh, entirely. Um, 
the the fallout from these pandemics? Yeah. Well, is there a is there a pattern of economic distress? Not well, just I think I think what we haven't done is actually investigated that. But think about removing from the consumer base. 50 to 100 million people, let's settle on 60 million people. You take those consumers out of the economy at the same time that you've got um, governments ceasing to buy grain, food in the same amounts because the war has ended. And what happens in 1919 across the world? Agricultural depression. You know, we think of the Great Depression as beginning in after the, you know, the crash in 29. In fact, in most countries of the world, agricultural depression was um, extensive as of 1919, 1920. Um, we don't make that connection because people haven't looked at it. I asked a, an economist about the impact of, of uh, the death, the numbers of deaths. And his initial response was, well, when you reduce the size of the labor force, their wages should go up. Um, mm. We are in the middle also of wartime production, though, so we don't. It's not easy to, to um, actually come to any kind of firm conclusion about that. But I, I think we have to just logically assume that losing that many consumers, and many of them are going to be poor and not consuming all that much. But at any rate, we're in a world, a global economy in 1918, 19, 19. So losing even 25 million consumers, it seems to me, has to have some kind of impact. We just don't know at this point what that impact was. Susan, did it, just curious, did it harden the society at all in terms of the fragility of the system? I mean, were the reforms, I keep thinking why we haven't had a 1918 until now. Did we make any sorts of permanent changes that helped society rebound and become, I mean, in other words, is there a silver lining to the 1918 flu epidemic that we benefited from? Dan, I'm struck by how many silver linings you want to find. In I'm going to find every lining out there today. <laughs> Everybody wants this. <laughs> well, in a number of countries that did not have them, now we have public health departments. Um, the United States had rudimentary ones. The, Britain didn't have a public health department. Um, in, on, in the European states, we now, after 1918, as a consequence, have public health services, in effect, that come about in consequence. Um, interestingly, the creation of a public health system in South Africa paves the way, I shouldn't say paves the way, helps to pave the way uh, towards segregation and apartheid because of the way then um, sections of Cape Town or Johannesburg were broken up and, and isolated one from the other. So even where there might have been some kind of neutral, even positive impact, we can see some negative effects coming out of that as well. Um, there's one thing that I didn't mention in my little speech at the front, and that is the fact that in China and Japan, where folk remedies were widespread in rural areas, the death rate seemed to be significantly lower than in other parts of the world. And it looks like they were taking in herbal and other kinds of remedies that contained an anti-fever component to them. And so we don't have all the numbers again, just because we have such bad data, but um, there are a number of demographers who've taken a look at China and Japan and medical folks and have, have deduced that it's this folk remedy containing uh, the anti-fever component that seems to have helped reduce that death rate there. It's an interesting counter to the notion of our scientific progress, but yeah. Uh, you know, and, and very interesting. And we, God, we, are, we are almost out of time here, but it makes me, uh, that's good comment, Susan, about uh, the flip side of that. Um, since we've had some questions about automation, is one of the impacts here going to be workers losing jobs because you're going to have robots and, and more automation and, yeah. and factories. And Zoom meetings. And Zoom yeah. meetings. Sure. I worry about that. I really do. Yeah. So that's the labor and economic side. I mean, we, again, we don't have a lot of time, but there are a few questions here about climate um, and about the existence of the human species. Dinosaurs were, were wiped out. Um, obviously, we don't know for sure, but um, 
will pandemics, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you link through history, climate, climate change um, with pandemics? We have a, a wonderful uh, a colleague named Paul, Paul Sutter who uh, works on yellow fever in the Panama Canal. And you know, yellow fever was a serious impediment to uh, US imperialism um, in the early 20th century. And one of the things that Paul has uh, recognized is uh, that in the construction of the Panama Canal, uh, Europeans actually helped to create the climatic conditions that enhanced the spread of yellow fever. Um, so, you know, it, that's just a, a little, a small example of the ways in which climate and our attempts to manipulate climate um, can blow back at us. Uh, and and you know, in the present, it's quite clear that uh, globalization has enhanced, for example, the, uh, the spread of, of the tiger mosquito, which carries dengue fever. Warming climate has enabled uh, the, the tiger mosquito to spread into new areas, helping dengue and Zika and other infections spread. So um, this is a very serious problem. And I, I, um, I think it's a good question to raise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of looking at silver linings again, since, I'm, <laughs> since that, that seems to be my role here, how interesting has it been to see clean air in a bunch of these cities that don't normally have clean air? I was reading something, uh, you know, in preparation for this by Edwin, Edwin Dennis Kilborn uh, uh, in one of these books on global catastrophic risks. And he was talking about how we had a population, I'm going from memory here, of like 1.6 billion people on the earth in 1900. And then since 1900, and it's not a coincidence that with all of our extra medical techniques and everything, we, we almost have 600% more people. And um, I had written in my book about how weird it was. It's almost like that, 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 uh, the theme from the Avengers movie, that if, if, if our efforts to have longer, healthier lives isn't somehow connected to a climate or a population or a, 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 an existence issue that, that hurts us on the law, it's a double-edged sword, right? We live longer, we live healthier, fewer people die. Ed, today, Edwin Gibbons' uh, siblings all would have probably lived that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, forgiven, it's a good thing. What if we had, you know, 15 billion people on the planet now? Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Yeah, I mean, population density obviously creates, contributes to climate change and contributes to the spread of uh, infectious diseases. Yeah. Um, if, if you could think of a lesson or two from the pandemics you know about, um, what would be lessons that you you, you teach today uh, from what we're going through now? Looking back through history, and, and obviously, Susan, your, your more specific case study, what was a lesson or two that, that succeeded, uh, that, uh, that helped post-pandemic societies after the pandemics passed through them? Um, if I could start with this, again, in the absence of treatment or a vaccine, which is the case in 1918 and 19, the only way this stopped was that the war ended, people stopped congregating in the huge numbers and providing the host for this deadly virus to sustain itself. Um, that's what ended this pandemic. And um, I think what we need to learn very, very um, acutely literally to this very moment is without a vaccine, without treatment in the age of coronavirus, we have to do the only thing we can do at this point just to deal with it. And that is to stay away from one another. Mm -hmm. Lil and Dan, a lesson or two? Wow. Well, <laughs> well I would say, you know, always pay attention and learn from it. I mean, one of the things I, I said at the start was that uh, epidemics tend to reveal the fault lines in societies in which they occur. And I think we can pay attention to that and learn where our fault lines are and then address them. Uh, that would be the silver lining that, that, that Dan um, is, is seeking. And I think we also going forward can anticipate what I've seen unfold in other 
epidemics, which is that we will see both the very worst of people and the very best of people under these conditions. And, uh, you know, we need to, to imagine ourselves and then um, try to behave in the very best of ways mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. Sounds reasonable. I keep thinking we're supposed to be such an adaptable species. That's supposed to be one of the real things that human beings bring to the table, right? We don't have the sharpest claws. We don't have the longest teeth. We're the smart ones who are adaptable. Um, I'm hopeful that there's a cause and effect thing here. We talked earlier about, you know, how, how we tend to remember the hot stove if we touched it recently or if the bodies are still warm. The bodies are still warm here. Um, what does that mean? You know, again, looking back on it someday, I wouldn't be surprised to have historians writing about how the great pandemic of 2020 altered society, human beings. Yeah. The, 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 and and I, I'm very curious as to, as to how that's going to be. And I don't think we're going to see the real boom in that until it, this essentially ends. Everybody gets to go out again and go, what? You know, when I was in news, if there was an earthquake, your entire job changed the minute the earthquake was over and everybody changed doing what they... This is an earthquake for us. And I think for many people, our entire job is going to change once it's over and we get back to normal. Some of us are just going to pick up our lives where they left off, but a lot of people aren't. And maybe that's what the generation that burned their hand on the hot stove, the most, most recent generation to go through a pandemic. I'll be interesting to see what the cause and effect thing is there long term. You think it could possibly then have an effect on health care system? Oh, I think if it University. doesn't, we're idiots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, we may be idiots. Yeah. <laughs> You're a wonderful counterpoint for me, Susan. <laughs> There's a silver lining in being idiots. Um, yes. What do you think it'll for do, it? What do you think it'll do for relations among nations or among other cultures? Will we have uh, will it bring the world closer together? Will there be more cooperation? I spoke uh, to an Israeli journalist the other day who suggested just the opposite. Who thought that you're gonna you're gonna have another argument for throwing up walls again, making sure that you can control your own borders in case this happens again? But you know, I can see it going either way. Yeah, I mean, you know, historians, we write about the past. We can't predict the future, but uh, but I I worry that uh, the logical outcome to me is more cooperation, more funding for the World Health Organization. You know, fixing our healthcare system. But I can very easily see it going the way that your Israeli friend projects that, okay, you know, these world inst global institutions and federal inst or national institutions have failed us. So we're going to look locally. Yeah, I think it will depend on our political leadership going forward. I and mean, some people after when, when the pandemic was first reaching the shores of Britain, for instance, were saying, see, see how right we were to do Brexit? And not that it had any impact, but mm -hmm. um, if that's the response, then we're in big trouble. But if we can get a more generous, more um, uh, capacious response, then, then it could go the other way. But it will depend on who we choose as our next leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as historians, we tend to, we can tend to be gloomy, but of course there's Dan and silver linings. <laughs> Only today, tomorrow it goes the other way. <laughs> what, what would you tell our student listeners now, 9-11 defined the millennials? Uh, will, will this be defining? Will, will this define this generation of young people? No, you I think, think it possible? will. I don't know how it will, but I, but it would, I can't see how it would not. Yeah. Do you know what I'm hoping? I, I would love to think that these people invent, meaning these people, the young people today, I've got two teenagers, I would love to think that they come out of this inventing ways so that the next time we have this inevitable influenza pandemic we're always hearing about, we have little coping mechanisms for all the things we're wondering about now, right? How do you get your food from the grocery store and have it not be contaminated? Well, we can't work on that right now very efficiently, but if you have 10 years between now and the next pandemic, maybe, and if we, if we remember the hot stove, maybe there will be ways to cope with it mm. better next time. I mean, I think what we're doing right now is coping with it, but we didn't think about this eight months ago. 
when we're done with this whole pandemic, people will probably be able to go, when this happens again, we'll have the next Zoom ready to, you know I mean? So I do think it's the natural human swinging of the pendulum that might get us, if it doesn't, if it's not too far away and we haven't forgotten too much, I think we'll handle this better next time. I, I'm really curious to see what, whether or how quickly we do forget about it. Um, you know, 1918 just disappeared from the radar until historians kind of rediscovered it at the beginning, I guess, in the late 70s and 80s. I'm struck teaching classes on epidemic disease, uh, how quickly we're forgetting about HIV and AIDS even. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just not, it doesn't register, uh, especially for, for younger people today. So I am curious, you know, I, the, the outcomes Dan describes would be wonderful. I, I wonder if we're even going to remember this 20 years from now, 30 years from now, or, yeah. or how we will remember it if we did. Certainly depend on how extensive that is, but when you, when you're trying, you know, it seems maybe it's human nature, or maybe it's just Americans. This pursuit of getting everything back to normal, getting out on the beaches, celebrating Easter, um, does that is, is what you're saying, Lil? Will it be a memory? Will this just be one of these terrible things that happen? But we move on. The post 19, the post sec first world war return to normalcy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. What, what does normal look like? Well, normal is what we had before and maybe it's some lessons are taken. But remember too, after 1918, 19, what we had to face, we had a great depression. Exactly. The second world war. Yes. Uh, so there's a little bit of upstaging going on. I right. think the combination of all those things right. created the historical amnesia, but I believe the traumas of the flu were too great for people to hold on to, to, mm -hmm internalize for very long because it would make them crazy. I think our social media situation are, are constantly being in touch through media will probably make it a lot more difficult to forget this one. Mm -hmm. I can't figure out whether that helps or not. Does the social media take our ability to panic each other, panic each other, which we used to do in newspapers and radio, and does it does it exponentially explode that, or does it end up counteracting the media's natural desire to whip up something extra, extra, read all about it? Ish, you know. Um, I, I do think that when we get done with this. Um, I think that people are going to have a sense though of the reality of it. Like I had said about Hong Kong, for example, I was talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about excess hospital capacity. And the way that that is framed normally in the United States is waste. waste. Excess hospital mm -hmm. capacity is waste. But now if you frame it differently with the economy and free fall now, doesn't it look more like insurance than mm -hmm. waste? Mm -hmm. So that's a way maybe you reframe it based on, this isn't a, um, a, a theoretical argument anymore. We have 30% unemployment staring us in the mirror. That's worth a lot of insurance. Don't you think a lot of insurance premium payments? Yeah, yeah. very good point. And I, you know, we are at the end of our time, but making a good point. You wonder um, what the memory will be. Will it be of the pandemic or will it be of an economic depression? Should there be one? Well, that would, it's what, what people will uh, be most struck by um, mm -hmm. in 10 or 20 years, but we'll leave it at that. I, I, I'm sorry we have to cut this short. Um, the time went by very quickly. I think I speak for all three of our uh, panelists in saying above all, history shows you need to be safe and you need to listen and um, listen to science and do the right thing. Um, and so we're urging, uh, like our governor of Colorado has urged, masks and just be sensible. Um, as we, you know, see this thing to the end. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, though, it was just illuminating. Um, and, and from what I'm getting on comments, uh, people don't want this to end either, but we have to okay. leave it at that. So thank you very, very much, all three of you. Thank you, Tom, and thanks, Lil and Dan. Thank you guys you were fantastic. You. Thank, thank you, you so Tom. much. Yeah. All right. Really enjoyed it. And thanks to the conference, too, and the staff there, too, of putting this yeah. on. Right. Everyone who watched, thank you for tuning in, everyone. Yes. Yeah, yeah really. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Be cool, everybody. Bye. Yep. <laughs> Be well. Take care of yourselves and take care of everybody you know. Yeah.